to start off this important event um, this afternoon. First of all, welcome everyone, um, and certainly welcome to Professor Andreas Schleicher, who is here um, to share with us uh, his thoughts about education for the future. The first thing I would like to do, though, is to thank our sponsors, the Tinkoping Foundation, who have always been a great friend to the Faculty of Education and have continuously provided their unfailing support. So we are grateful to them for their sponsorship of this important event um, today. Let me just share um, a few words about uh, Professor Schleicher. Um, but you should, uh, you should know from the start that the few words that I would say do not do justice to his um, sort of enormous career and the influence that he has had on education uh, globally. Uh, Professor Andreas Schleicher is Director for Education and Skills at the OECD. He initiated and oversees the Program for initial, uh, International Student Assessment, uh, better known as PISA, and other international instruments that have created a global platform for policymakers, researchers, and educators across nations and cultures to innovate and transform educational policies and practices. We were having sort of a little chat um, before as we were waiting for the audience. Um, and I learned from Andreas that uh, he is going back to Paris, the OECD headquarters um, in a couple of days because he needs to see to the office because there are over 200 people um, in the office. And when he started, there were only four people. So that gives you some sense of how large the education enterprise has grown under his leadership at OECD. Professor Schleicher has worked for over 20 years with ministers and education leaders around the world to improve quality and equity in education. I dare say that he's on first name basis uh, with just about every minister, prime minister, governor, um, and education leader um, internationally. The former US Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, who served under um, Barack Obama, said that Professor Schleicher, and I quote, understands the global issues and challenges as well as or better than anyone I've met. And he tells me the truth. Former UK Secretary of State, Michael Gove, called him, quote, the most important man in English education, even though Andreas is German and he lives in France. That gives you a sense, again, of his influence, that he is the most important man in blank education. Hong Kong education, Singapore education, US education, Lithuanian education, the list goes on. When Andreas speaks, the world listens because so much wisdom uh, comes from him. Before joining the OECD, Professor Schleicher was director for analysis at the International Association for Educational Achievement, and everyone knows it as IEA. He studied physics in Germany mm -hmm. and received a degree in mathematics and statistics in Australia. He is the recipient of numerous orders, uh, honors and awards, including the Theodore Hughes Prize, awarded in the name of the first president of the Federal uh, Republic of Germany for exemplary democratic engagement. He holds an honorary professorship at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andreas Schleicher. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We are eager and ready for your presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Goodwin, and good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure to share some thoughts with you today on the future of education. And it's really hard for us to think about the future of education. Education is an incredibly conservative social enterprise, you know, and often as parents, we are not the solution. We are part of the problem. Now, we get very anxious when our children no longer learn what was very important to us or when they do learn things we no longer understand as teachers you know teachers often teach more like <clears throat> how they were taught than how they were taught to teach and as a minister of education you can lose your job over education when something small goes wrong but you <clears throat> never win an election over education issues because it just takes so much time to translate good ideas into into better outcomes and that's why the status quo in education just has so many protectors. But, you know, I think the COVID pandemic has shown us that, you know, the future will always surprise us. 
it has deeply disrupted not just the operation of schools but also our view on education on the purpose of education uh, uh, what is very clear that in this pandemic you know those students who were just you know spoon fed with bit, uh, bits and pieces of knowledge uh, who just were absorbing knowledge learn how to repeat it uh, they were not particularly successful in this pandemic those students who had learned how to learn who were open to new ways of learning who had access to great technologies a supportive ecosystem around them whose teachers were not just you know transmitters of knowledge but great coaches great mentors great facilitators they could manage when schools were closed now, this pandemic has really questioned many of the foundations of our education systems and once again you know the future will always surprise us you know climate change is going to change our lives probably a lot more than uh, this pandemic and uh, artificial intelligence will put our you know the purpose of education much more to the test our education systems have done well to educate you know second class robots people who are good at repeating what we told them but what makes us human in a world where the kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test have also become easy to digitize to automate to outsource these are the challenges that you know the world will pose to us and education system will need to find very very good answers to this if we want to motivate people to spend their time and energy you can see in many countries you now young people these days say you know, I'm not, I don't know how tomorrow looks like. Why should I study hard for the next 20 years? How do we motivate education? How do we motivate, you know, employers? And how do we motivate governments to give priority to education? And then there are lots of other things that are going to disrupt, you know, uh, our future in the, in the years to come. And uh, actually at the OECD, we are looking at those things quite systematically all the time. It's actually quite an interesting analysis we call this trend shaping education this is not about education but these are <coughs> about the big societal societal influences that you know shape the future of education and we need to understand them in order to respond well to them you know when we surveyed school leaders in the last PISA assessment about those big questions in the world it looks that schools are actually doing a lot in this field you could see, for example, climate change, and I'm talking here about 2018, you know, almost 90% of principals said, yeah, you know, we do that in our curriculum. Or, you know, gender equality or international conflicts, causes of poverty, migration, and even a pandemic features in what we teach. And this was before the pandemic. So it looks as a lot of those big future issues feature in our curriculum. But then, you know, when we surveyed students, we got a very different impression. You know, uh, most young people say looking after the global environment is really important to me. Now, you can see today a generation of young people for whom that issue is urgent and important. You know, they want to do something about it. That's the one side of the coin, and that corresponds to what principals just told you. you know. But then, when you ask yourself, you know, can I do something about the problems of the world? Or will my behavior impact people in other countries? The bars get a lot shorter. And I think that tells us something about the fund most fundamental challenge in our systems. We are able to create awareness among students. We're able to give them the knowledge, but we are not helping students to develop that agency, that capacity to take a role, to take a stance, to take a responsibility to mobilize their cognitive social and emotional resources that gap is you know in the past it was not so much a problem you know we used to learn to do the work and then you know we were ready for the work but nowadays it's really about agency it's about taking responsibility taking action and our systems generally don't do so well about it and you can break that down by country you can see in some countries a little better in others less so, but overall that gap is visible in virtually every education system. This idea of student agency that the future of education is no longer just about teaching students something, 
but more about providing them with a reliable compass and the tools to navigate with confidence in this world that is increasingly volatile, complex, you know, ambiguous, uh, uncertain, you know, VUCA as they call it. You know. That's the kind of general uh, idea that I wanted to convey to you and I'm going to illustrate this with a lot of data. You know. In the past, you know, we, it was enough to teach students something. You know. Basically, they established, it was about establishing, you know, conveying the established wisdom of our world. Today, it's more about helping students to question the established wisdom of the world, to manage complex ways of thinking, to manage complex ways of working. And I'm going to come back to this. This transition is, is you know, still not well understood. It's no longer about, you know, we know what the answers are. It's about finding out what the right questions are. It's about ways of thinking. In the past, you know, our economies only needed a few really well-educated workers and a lot of people who worked for them. So education was mainly about sorting. So that's the function that education systems know really, really well. Today is very much about helping all students to learn at very high levels. In fact, I think Hong Kong is an interesting case here. Hong Kong is actually quite good at that. Now, even students from disadvantaged social backgrounds develop actually quite high level of, of, of competency. Very different from what we see in many parts of the Western world where you know, poverty is often destiny. So I think that's something, you know, some systems do better than others, but it's uh, an area that all systems need to do better. Our education systems were designed to teach the average student. Now, we sort of conceptualize what the average student looked like and we gear instructional practice towards that kind of student. These systems don't do so well to teach students who are exceptional. And the future is about, you know, finding the extraordinary talents of ordinary students now, to ensure that all students can reach their potential, which doesn't mean that they learn all the things and all do well in math mathematics and science and, and history, but that they can fully, you know, capitalize on their talent. And that means that teachers need to become increasingly good at understanding how different students learn differently and embrace that diversity with, you know, creative, innovative, differentiated pedagogy. And that brings me to the next, you know, challenge. In the past, uh, teaching was about standardization and compliance. It's about, you know, uh, helping teachers, you know, equip teachers with a set of techniques and practices. Now you need to have teachers who are creative designers of innovative learning environments, who can invent the future, who can, you know, in that context, find the right answers to those kinds of questions. Now. And then, you know, that brings you to the question of work organization. Uh, you know, high professional knowledge workers don't like to work in a factory. Now, that's very, very clear. And um, that's still what our school systems look like. They are designed like an industrial, you know, uh, system. They uh, have a very kind of hierarchical structure. And they basically treat teachers as exchangeable widgets on an assembly line. And that work organization is being challenged you know uh, uh, just uh, these days we are launching our new edition of education the glance which looks at many questions including you know how teachers are recognized and rewarded and there are some education systems where teachers are paid actually quite well but still nobody wants to become a teacher the challenge is no longer just making teaching financially attractive it's about making teaching intellectually more attractive, giving teachers a more interesting set of tasks, a more interesting career, a, more, a, a better support. No? That's the challenge that, you know, the systems need to deal with. No? So um, all I'm going to do in the rest of my presentation is talk about some of those challenges with a little bit of data, but that's basically the idea, you know, how can we move from, from the past to the future, future where uh, learning is no longer passive, but an active process. No? In fact, you know, I, uh, you can, you can, you will see that some of the things I will be talking about probably we did better hundreds of years ago than we are doing it now. Hundreds of years ago, education was really about developing the individual and the teacher was a mentor and the student was a learner. 
And then came the industrial age where sort of we try to make people compatible with our ways of thinking, our ways of working and sort of rolling out education on, on a mass scale. And that has created many, many of the kind of problems. It's also led to a kind of in the recent decades, what I would call a kind of commodification in education. You know, students became consumers. Teachers were looked at as service providers and parents as clients. And uh, school choice became a very dominant kind of school phenomenon. And uh, that is taking often the heart out of education, the idea that it's a whole of society enterprise, that everybody plays an important role. And again, you know, in the pandemic, uh, we have seen the value of that. You know. Education during the pandemic only worked if everybody did their part. But if students were active learners, if parents were, you know, good you know, social workers, they support us, if teachers were you know, great mentors. So again, I think, you know, we are seeing that some of those ideas uh, will uh, need to become more at the center of education. But let's, you know, go through this a little bit more systematically. You know, how do we advance from helping students establish the, you know, wisdom or reproduce the wisdom of our times to question, you know, our ways of thinking, our ways of working, to think for themselves, you know, to learn to live with themselves, to learn to live with other people, to learn to live with the planet. Now, those are the big challenges today. If you look at the world around you, some of these things are quite obvious. Now, the kind of uh, things that are easy to teach, easy to test, becoming easy to digitize, I already said that. You know, we call them those skills routine cognitive skills. Basically, these are things that you can express and describe by an algorithm. Now, anything that you can describe by an algorithm, you know, a computer can do better than people. Now. And I think that's true for teachers as well. You know, the tasks of teachers that you can describe by an algorithm, you know, uh, shouldn't be done with teachers. That they will be done better by, by computers. You know? I think a lot of knowledge transmission is already becoming more interesting, more engaging by technology than whatever teachers do on this. And so I think this is something that we can see in every part of workplaces of societies, you know? routine, Manual tasks disappeared in the 70s, you know, when robots were taking over our whole factories and routine cognitive skills are disappearing now. And actually, the people who are most challenged are the people who made themselves like second class computers. And a lot of this is happening, you know, a lot of tasks, cognitive tasks, we basically downgraded so that they could be described by an algorithm. So we tailorized the work. We took out, you know, the kind of holistic perspectives where humans are really, really good. And we feel the price for this. The other dimension, of course, is technology. Uh, technology intensive tasks are gaining in importance. And you put the two things together and then you know what the future of work is going to look like. Now, I think this is actually quite well understood now. We have a quite good analysis uh, of the drivers of the future of work, you know, the loss of routine tasks and the increase in technology intensive tasks. That's basically what we know the world of work will demand from people. And uh, you can see that already playing out in our economies. Now here on the vertical axis, uh, you may know uh, the PISA test where we look at the knowledge and skills of people in the school uh, sector. Uh, we did a similar test in the adult workforce. Basically, we uh, gave adults, a representative sample of adults, a test that uh, looked at their uh, numeracy skills, and their literacy skills, and things like this, problem solving skills. And you can see that here on the vertical axis, the higher countries are, the better you know they perform on that test. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, I show you the risk of automation in those countries. Now, basically, the more you are to the right, the more likely you are going to lose jobs because of automation. And you can see the two things are related. Now, the higher the level of skills in a population, the more immune that population is from automation. Now, so skills are you know, our best vaccination against you know, the risks of digitalization. Now, and people often see digitalization as a threat uh, but it's only a threat to those who are not prepared. For those who are prepared, actually, it's a world of opportunities. We know that technology-intensive workplaces are much better at extracting value from the skills of people. If you work in a 
technology intensive workplace, you're a lot more likely to learn for yourself, you're a lot more likely to learn with your coworkers, you're a lot more likely sort of to learn by doing no? some good data on this. No? And I think that's something we should take to heart that technology is not a thing that is good or bad, but it's something that you know empowers those who are well prepared and uh, puts those at risk who uh, don't have the right skills. No? That's the same kind of reality, but I wanted to, you know, show you this. In the last PISA assessment, we ask 15 year olds, what do you want to do in your life? No? What kind of job would you like to do when you are 30? And uh, this was a surprise to us no? that uh, you can see 30, 40, sometimes 50% of young people and more so disadvantaged than advantaged ones look for jobs that are unlikely to exist when they graduate. No? They see a world around them and the school is telling them around about a world that is unlikely to exist. No? They are sort of looking at jobs that are at high risk of automation. And uh, they think they are secure because they have people around them, like maybe their parents, maybe their friends who do those kinds of things. But our schools are not very good at conveying the future of work, the future of the world, to the next generation. They, you know, portray a world that existed in the past and that's shaping the mindset of young people. And the media actually reinforce it often as well. Like, uh, <clears throat> that's one of the things that uh, we need to take to heart. And those, you know, you can say, well, at 15, nobody has to decide about the future. But uh, that is true. <clears throat> but you know, the most important career decisions you don't make when you graduate from school and go to university or after university. The most important career decision you make when you enter school. You know, that's when you decide, am I going to take school really serious? Uh, where am I going to put my emphasis? Am I going to study hard? Am I going to study fields that are really difficult? No? If you know, people do not understand the relevance of certain fields of knowledge, they will not place their heart in it. They will maybe just, you know, learn the mechanics of it. And that's the issue. We can see big gender stereotypes emerging as well. You know, in a way, you can, <coughs> Hong Kong is a great example. Boys and girls actually develop similar levels of science performance on the PISA test. The education system is done, doing really well in Hong Kong to give both boys and girls a good foundation in science. But then, if you ask these 15-year-olds, uh, what do you want to do in your life? You can see that uh, girls, you know, are doing well on the science test, but they do not see science as going to open life opportunities for them. That's where we fail. Our education systems, you know, just, you know, fill people with specific subject matter content, but we are not very good in helping them to sort of relate that to their own career, to their own future, to see that almost any school subject can open life opportunities for them. And then, you know, when you graduate from education, many doors are closed in your mind and you're not going to pursue many opportunities that may be very relevant. And you pay a high price for this economically, socially, but also in our civic society. So here you can see really how our schools are preparing for a world, at least a large share of young people for a world <coughs> that no longer exists. And uh, you can see also the orange bars are longer everywhere than the blue bars which tells you that uh, many young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, have an even more myopic view of the world. They know their parents, they may do simple jobs, they know their friends. Students from wealthier families have more opportunities to see the richness of the world, even though, you know, not by as much as you might think. So that's, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight to you. And digitalization is going to drive this further. Now, digitalization is incredibly democratizing. Everybody can contribute. Everybody can collaborate. But it's also concentrating power at a rate we've never seen before. Now, that kind of tension is very, very real. Now, technology is incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard anywhere. Now, you post something on Twitter and the world can follow you. But technology is also incredibly homogenizing, squashing individual differences, cultural uniqueness, no? questions around identity, agency, become very, very real also for education. 
Technology is incredibly empowering. You, know, you can see that in no place better than in Hong Kong. Your most successful companies are no longer created by a big industry, but they are created by a big idea. You know. They often have the product before they have the money. But let's not forget that for those who are unprepared, technology can be incredibly disempowering. When we become the slaves of algorithms who tell us, you know, whether to turn left or right or you know, what to do, what to think, you know, your fitness computer tells you whether you're healthy, you know, you'd lose that feeling for yourself. That is the other part of the reality. And I think uh, what you need to really take to heart that, you know, artificial intelligence is not a magic power. It's just a great amplifier. It's just a great accelerator. It amplifies good ideas and good practice in the same way that it amplifies bad ideas and bad practice. No? For teachers, artificial intelligence can help them to understand how different students learn differently, to see, to look into the minds of students, to help students, you know, a much, with much more tailored pedagogy. Or artificial intelligence can, you know, reinforce stereotypes that teachers have by, you know, portray portraying the future of students based on the past of other students, you know, putting them into kind of schemes and and uh, and uh, uh, fixed images. No? That's really, really important. It's our capacity to utilize technology that will make the difference. No? And that brings me back to this compass. The idea that we, you know, develop that capacity to navigate ambiguity. Of course, you know, knowledge will always be important. But in the OECD, in our Education 2030 project, we look at knowledge quite differently. Disciplinary knowledge is just a surface. Uh, we, you know, whether what, what you teach in science, you know, physics and chemistry will always be important. But in the future... What is far more important is whether students learn to think like a scientist. Can you design an experiment? Can you distinguish questions that are scientifically investigable from questions that cannot? Those are these ways of scientific thinking that are so important. Can you think like a historian? History is not about names and places. It's about understanding of a, how a narrative of a society has emerged, how it developed, how it advanced, and sometimes how it unravels when the context changes. Can you think like a philosopher? Can you think like a mathematician? In mathematics, you know, we spend a lot of time training people how to calculate an exponential function. We don't help them understand the nature of an exponential function. It's actually a good example. You know, um, we are not very familiar with exponentials. Now the human world is a linear world. Time is linear. Space is linear. That's the world in which we are comfortable. Exponentials are really hard to understand intuitively. But they're all around us. The pandemic is an amazing example of it. Why do we have such a hard time dealing with this pandemic? Because, you know, the philosophy of this pandemic is exponential. That's basically the paradigm on which it operates. And we do not understand it. That's why we send, you know, 200 doctors when we need to send 3,000. Uh, because we do not understand those phenomena. But if we own the world of mathematics, we can suddenly open up new perspectives, new opportunities. But we do so little of it. No? Science, the same thing. You know, we teach science like religion. We make students believe certain concepts and ideas uh, and uh, then to reproduce them rather than to help them develop those ways of thinking. Uh, to Science is an amazing kind of opportunity, another toolbox that people can have to understand the world, to engage with the world, to question the world. Uh, as a scientist, you know, uh, uh, it's not about accumulating knowledge. It's about constantly questioning the world around you, being able to learn to unlearn and relearn, you know, to look for, you know, the contradiction of your own theory, to be open to the novelty. You know. But we don't do very well in our schools. Now we have this kind of textbooks and we want to get that textbooks in the in the minds of, of young people and that's how our systems are de-working. You know. That's the challenge. You know, you know I, I, and then of course, you know, uh, our curricula, it's very easy to put new things on it 
Now, everybody will love you if you do something new in education uh, on top of everything else, but uh, people will hate you when you try to take something away because they always claim that's the most important thing that was there. Yeah. You know, when I started with the PISA assessment in mathematics in 2003, that was the first time we focused on mathematics. Uh, and the first thing that we did is we looked around the world, what do people at age 15 when we test learn in mathematics? And we found that, you know, it's a lot of teaching of trigonometry in that age. Now. So I asked myself, interesting, you know, why do we do this? So I went to ask the mathematicians, is trigonometry one of the, you know, foundation concepts of mathematics? And they said, no, it's just a specific application. So I said, oh, maybe there must be other reasons. So I asked the engineers, you know, do you need a lot of people who know trigonomics? And they told me, no, you know, it's all done by computers these days. You know. So when I, you know, studied this in more detail, I found that actually we teach trigonomics because three, four hundred years ago, it was a very important concept for people to design the houses, uh, measure the size of the fields, things like this. Yeah. But we kept it in the curriculum just because it's always been there. It somehow served a purpose. Yeah. In Europe, you will find lots of people who say, people should learn Latin in order to think logically. Well, actually, there's no, you know, no theory, no kind of evidence base that supports that, science, that Latin is the best way to teach people logical thinking. It was just one of the first subjects that was taught in school, and yet people learn to think logically. But we don't question those things today. No? So I think this shift from, you know, pure content, which is the surface, learning the, the foundations of the disciplines is really, really important for the future. Interdisciplinary learning. Can you think across the boundaries of subject matter disciplines? Can you think about a problem from different perspectives, different ideas? Can you work with people who think differently than you? Very, very important things. That's basically, I think, where we have to start to reconceptualize knowledge. I think the future is not about, you know, just doing more. It's about teaching fewer things at greater depths. But understanding what are the foundations and what, what are the enduring foundations of enduring value and what are the things that will actually change very quickly. Yeah. And also keep in mind that, you know, the world no longer rewards people just for what they know. No. Google or Baidu know everything. No. The world rewards people for what they can do with what they know. That's where the skills dimension becomes very important. And when you, are, when you talk about skills, people think very quickly to cognitive skills, you know, creativity, critical thinking. And yes, they're very, very important. What we still don't grasp very well are the social and emotional skills that make people successful. And once again, they are gaining in relevance. They're gaining in importance. A couple of weeks ago, we launched our first international assessment of social emotional skills, and it, it caught many people by surprise. Some students, you know, that do very well academically struggle on, you know, openness, on resilience, on empathy, on many of the dimensions that we measure. They're not a natural byproduct of high academic performance. They need to be developed quite consciously, and we're not doing this because they're not articulated. We can't measure them very well. So, you know, and what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. No. This is something I think we need to take on the skill dimension, a harder look. Where is the, you know, where do we complement the artificial intelligence that we created in our computers, uh, not substitute computers? No. And then, you know, if you ask me, sum it up, uh, what are the most transformative competencies uh, these days? Well, at the OECD, we think uh, one thing is obvious, I think, for everyone. It's the capacity of people to create new value, to imagine, to build new ideas, no? to take responsibility, no? to mobilize your cognitive, social, emotional resources, to reconcile tensions and dilemmas. Now, the world is no longer black and white, but your capacity to navigate ambiguity really is the key. Yeah. I want to just show you one chart from the, from the, from the PISA assessment that uh, tells a very interesting story about you know, uh, your education system in Hong Kong. <clears throat> on the vertical axis, you see the PISA performance. Now, the higher the country is, the better it performs on the PISA test. On the horizontal axis, you see a measure of growth mindset. 
Now that we actually look at the extent to which students own their success, to which they believe that they can grow beyond their current limits. And you can see in the OECD area, Estonia is the number one performer, and it's also the country where students generally have that open-mindedness, you know, about themselves. They believe that, you know, if I try hard, you know, I can change things, I can expand beyond my current limits. You contrast this with Indonesia, you know, where students struggle with the PISA test and they basically all believe that education is about, you know, the intelligence they were born with. If you believe that, you know, success is about uh, intelligence, then why would you study hard? It's not something you can change. And then you see a system like Hong Kong. Isn't that interesting? The system actually does very well on PISA. No? Students have learned a lot, but they have not, you know, developed that growth mindset. And you can say, what's more important? Well, you know, both are important. In school, you need to learn a lot. But in life, you know, if you do not have that growth mindset, you know, how are you going to deal with failure? How are you going to be open to new challenges? How are you going to become resilient to the future? So Hong Kong is a, is a, is a great case where actually the system is doing quite well in you know, teaching students academically. But it's missing out on some of the social and emotional foundations that in a changing world, in a world of you know, rising ambiguity, uh, the system is losing out. You know, and, and people say, well, this is just about PISA. Yeah, it's only one dimension, but you can see also students with a growth mindset were more likely to be motivated to master difficult tasks. They had a greater sense of self-efficacy. They were less afraid of failure. No? And that is so important. If you want your people to be creative, imaginative, you have to give them space no? to, to experiment. If they experiment, they take risks. If they take risks, they make mistakes. Our system... Uh, are not good at helping students learn from and with mistakes. Maybe, you know, the next generation will not become so creative. I think, you know, the, the most, one of the most important, you know, traits or, you know, capacities, competences of teachers is humility towards failure. No. Having respect for failure, having respect for students who fail. Then also we saw that students with a growth mindset were more likely to establish ambitious learning goals. They saw greater value in school. All things that are really, really important. Now, that was the first part, you know, the, the, the new competences. But I want to also equally highlight the second part. You know, how do we move from a world where only some people succeed to a world in which everybody can reach their potential? There's something we talk a lot about in education. You know, almost it's annoying because it's such an empty word, this word of inclusion and equity. It's just a catchphrase. The reality is still very, very different. You can see, for example, uh, in some education systems, they have uh, gone a long way into this. Now, if you look, for example, to Finland, only about 6-7% of the performance variation on the PISA test lies between schools. Now, think about this. In Finland, the closest school is always the best school. The system has done really, really well to achieve very well for all schools. As a parent, you don't have to worry about school choice because actually, you know, the closest school will always be your best choice. Very little variation in school performance. Within schools, there's a lot of variation. That's the gray bar here, but the, the, the orange bar is very, very small. You look at the other end of the spectrum is Israel huge variability in school performance now, where you enroll your child will be you know highly predictive on the average performance in the school and we know that you know being the small fish in the big pond in school is always a lot better than to be the big fish in the small pond so these things are actually very influential so school choice suddenly matters a lot now. and uh, hong kong is sort of in the middle but perhaps also more to the right side, you know, where the variability in school performance is an important player. So, yeah, we can do some education systems have been very successful, but many school systems struggle. There's a lot of variability with this. No? And um, <clears throat> I think that's one of the big challenges of an education system to ensure coherence, no? to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms to align resources with needs, to give all students the opportunities to reach their potential. 
formula-based, you know, financing, resourcing. There are a lot of tools that we can use actually to be more like Finland, you know, to be more coherent in our education systems. You know. And you can see actually to some extent that's also reflected in the way we align resource with needs currently. You know. When you see, for example, in the case of Hong Kong, if you are in a disadvantaged area, you're going to have fewer resources. You're going to have the worst qualified teachers and so on. So the system has not been so great in aligning resources with needs. No. Moving more to the right side is important to have a system that is better aligning those resources with needs. No. Let me bring you to the third point. I have to speed up a bit. We are sort of running a bit late. Um, I can see that. Um, but uh, how do we advance the kind of teaching profession from you know, just looking upwards in the system to looking outwards to the next teacher, to the next school, to have that level of you know, combination of professional autonomy in a collaborative culture? You know? When you think about teacher professionalism, <clears throat> it's always about three dimensions. The first is about the knowledge base that teachers have. You know? This is about what they know about their subject. You know? The first thing that students discover is whether their teachers have a real passion and a deep understanding for what they teach, no? whether they are real experts in their field of knowledge. No? The second thing <coughs> that you know is important is how well teachers understand how different students learn their subject. Now that's the pedagogical aspect. But there's a third aspect that I think is often not so well articulated, and that is how well do teachers actually know their students? In the pandemic, that was crucial. You know, the moment you have teachers, students sitting in front of you, you, you don't need to know them. You can just you know, deal with them. The moment they are no longer in front of you, you actually need to know them or you will not engage them. So I think that knowledge of students is uh, uh, very important. <clears throat> An education system that does very well on this is Japan. You know, in Japan, students spend, uh, teachers spend more time with students outside the classroom than inside the classroom. You know, they have lots of, you know, uh, social support for them. They have a lot of mentoring. They have a lot of club activities. Uh, this is very important to the system <clears throat> that teachers develop that relationship with students. China, parts of China that I know are also very good at that. You know, the province of Shanghai, teachers devote a lot of time to actually build that social fabric to become, you know, uh, take on a role, uh, uh, you know, almost as, as parents to be sort of this, this kind of <coughs> social support for students is very important. But generally, I think it's the, it's the least well articulated dimension. The other, you know, second pillar is professional autonomy. It's, it's very clear, you know, where teachers, you know, are creative designers of innovative learning environments. They, you know, are much more successful than where they just, you know, implement, you know, prefabricated practice. And the last part, is about uh, professional collaboration. And uh, actually, I think uh, Singapore is doing amazing things on this. Now, where teachers always work in teams. Japan, where teachers do lesson study. They constantly watch what other teachers are doing. They collaborate on research projects. Now, Finland, every teacher has to do a research master thesis when they get educated. And the idea is not that they become you know, researchers, but that they develop that research mindset to you know, constantly think about pedagogical practice. Not about I deliver this, but I actually advance my profession. I'm connected to my colleagues. Uh, that is very, very important. And um, just to sort of uh, show you some, some data on this, no? the more teachers teach jointly as a team in the same class, the more they observe other teachers uh, and provide feedback, the more they engage in joint activities, the more they take part in collaborative professional development, the you know, more prevalent is the use of effective teaching practice. No? You find effective teaching practice through collaboration and you're more likely to implement it when you've seen other people implementing it well. No? So that link between you know, teacher professional collaboration and um, the use of effective teaching practice is very important. This is from our TALIS survey. Uh, what's also interesting, teacher professional collaboration is one of the best predictors for job satisfaction. We find, you know, a modest relationship between salaries and job satisfaction, as you would expect. We find no relationship between class size and job satisfaction. 
simply not true that teachers in smaller classes are happier than teachers in larger classes. No support for this empirically. But teacher professional collaboration. Am I connected? Am I, you know, working with my colleagues? Am I sort of, that's a very, very important predictor of uh, job satisfaction. So, you know, that's the third pillar of professional uh, professionalism, that collaborative culture is one that some education systems articulate really well, but others have still a long way to go. And once again, when you think about the future of education, this will become increasingly important. You, know. you can less and less rel rely on what comes, you know, top down because this kind of bureaucratic processes are way too slow to deal with disruptions like a pandemic. You need to more and more rely on what you get from your colleagues. Now. Some education systems uh, do that in very systematic ways. For example, in Finland, if you are a school principal or Estonia, uh, you spend about two thirds of your time leading your school and you will spend one third of your time uh, being an administrator in the local community. So the local community is not made up of bureaucrats, you know, uh, who are you know legal, uh, legal experts, but of school teachers who are practitioners. So the local community is a place where you, as a school principal, learn to address and uh, with your peers the problems that you face in your schools. Now you solve your own problems, not somebody else's, and you learn from your neighboring schools how they solve the similar problems. That is the culture of professional collaboration it is so important generally in education we're not doing so well with this in other fields i think uh, is much better established no my, my background is physics and actually as a physicist you're well connected to your profession you speak a similar language you have a shared idea set you 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 can very easily connect to someone working in your field of specialization that's not so easy in teaching very different ideas, pedagogical beliefs, practices. We don't have a common language. The same ideas are expressed in many different ways. It's much harder uh, to do that in the field of education. But those systems that are doing well on this are, are really f very well, uh, doing very well. Um, when I visited Shanghai um, early on, I, I was most impressed. They had a digital platform where teachers can share their model lessons, practices, lesson plans, and so on. And what I found really interesting, they had combined that with reputational metrics. So the more other teachers would, you know, download your lessons, criticize your lessons, improve your lessons, redesign your lessons, the more appreciation you would get in the system. And at the end of the school year, your school leaders would not only ask you how well did you teach your class, but what contribution did you make to the profession? How are you regarded by your peers? This is really, really important. Let me move on to this uh, <coughs> fourth pillar. How do we advance from a culture of prescription to a culture of professional ownership, of practice? And that comes back to the question of where decisions are being made. You have some education systems here in the Netherlands, uh, Czech Republic, where a lot is actually happening at the front line. Uh, Hong Kong would also be a good example, but I don't have data for Hong Kong on this. You have other education systems where like Turkey and Greece, where schools have virtually no say in the system. Everything is decided by higher levels. Now. And then you have Finland at the end, which is very interesting. You need to decide always in collaboration. You know, you decide, the school decides in collaboration with the local community. The local community actually consult with the regional and state levels. It's a constant dialogue between the different layers of education. But obviously this is a very important question. If we want to sort of create that culture, that kind of decision, where decisions are made by whom and how is crucially important. And once again, at the moment, we have still a very industrial work culture in education. We don't have that professional culture yet, but it does actually matter. You can see, for example, the greater the role of school principals and in fact also teachers. Uh, on many aspects like resource allocations, res uh, curriculum, disciplinary policies, assessment, admission, and so on, the better performing the system. Yeah. That's, I think, something that uh, is quite coming out quite clear. You cannot you know, easily read cause and effect into this. There are lots of things going on. There's a lot of research trying to understand those things, but I think the phenomenon is one that is very important. How do we move from a culture 
uh, where we teach students in individual subjects, where you know we make a distinction between academic and vocational education, all of that, to a more integrated education system, now, where we are better at integrating the subjects, help students think across the boundaries of subject disciplines, uh, help students with different talents to learn in similar learning environments, and so on. How do we integrate the, the real world with the school world? Now? Schools are very good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. How do we break some of those walls to better connect what's going on in school with the world of work, with the society around us? Now? That's something where you know countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, have done a lot to actually achieve that. Now, schools have become more important places in the communities. Now. And that includes parents, you know, where students thought my parents are really interested in my learning at school. They were much more ambitious in their learning, but they were happier with their lives. These things do really matter. I think the system around, the social fabric around, has a lot to do with how students approach the field of learning. And last but not least, you know, how do we move from the kind of idiosyncratic policies that dominate education today? You know, every, every year we put something new on top of the system and we don't worry about how that actually translates into practice. Now, we have a system that has no links between intended policies, implemented policies and achieved policies. This complete disconnect. Now, the future is more about alignment. The faster the world works, the more alignment will become important. And let me conclude with just, you know, thinking about that future. How do, how do we imagine the future? Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, not, nor do I. But actually, I think it's very important that we imagine different futures. Not just to, to try to guess what's going to happen tomorrow, but to be able to imagine different futures and to be able to sort of anticipate what do those futures mean. And the more open we are to alternative futures, the better we are prepared for the future that eventually arrives. Well, one scenario, and that's the simplest, is simply, you know, we will just, you know, continue to evolve. There will be you no know, little disruption, but students will, you know, formal education will continue to evolve and expand. Maybe, you know, some things will improve and so on. But overall, you know, um, the system as it stands will prevail. Teachers will be the dominant source of learning. Students will be, you know, the recipients of that learning. It's one scenario. And, you know, don't think it's so strange, that scenario. Now, after the pandemic, people say, no, no, everything is going to be very different. Well, we have said this many times before in history. And education, the structures of education have been remarkably resistant to real change. But, you know, there is a second scenario. And that is that, you know, this system will simply break down under its own weight, under the pressures of digitalization. And parents will just turn to other solutions, other providers. Now, we can see that today in countries like Korea, you know, where actually students sleep in the classroom because they learn in so much more interesting and relevant ways out of schools uh, in, in a lot of kind of digital environments. Now, that's, I think, one of the challenges that our education systems will go through, that basically schools no longer have a natural monopoly. There are now many different ways of making learning accessible. In the past, the teacher was your only source of learning. Now, actually, you have many different pathways. And in this pandemic, we have seen how many parents choose you know, those kinds of alternatives. That's something I think we should not discard. It's something that we should take to heart with all of its consequences now, on equity, on inclusion, on relevance. Now. Very, very important questions that will emerge. Now. There is, and um, <clears throat> I just want to show you the, the kind of digital scenario, why it's not completely unlikely. You, know? you can see that for many young people, the digital world has already become the real world. You can see in a country like you know Denmark and uh, Sweden, oh, sorry, uh, in uh, Denmark and Sweden, you have almost 50% of students, uh, uh, <coughs> students who spend almost 50 hours per week uh, using the internet. There's very little else going on. That's more than many adults go to work. And in Hong Kong, you keep young people very busy with schooling, but still also there, you can see it's 30 hours. That is an enormous amount of time where the internet becomes the dominant source of, of learning and of working. But, you know, 
using digital tools doesn't mean that we are really well prepared for them. And that's another picture I wanted to just show you. When you look actually at the capacity of young people to use the internet, to actually navigate the internet, to distinguish fact from opinion, to you know think critically, to connect different information streams, to navigate ambiguity, and that's what it means to use the internet, not just you know to play with your mobile phone. You can say, you know, Hong Kong is one of the systems doing best, but even there, you are just talking about half of the students being prepared for this. The rest of the students have very limited navigation skills or no navigation skills. And often it's the most disadvantaged students being least prepared. They're going to become the victims of, of digital fraud, of, you know, fake news, all of this. And, you know, you're lucky in Hong Kong. You look at the rest of the world. You know, in many countries, it's the vast majority of students who are simply not ready for the tools that exist. Now, technology has evolved so much faster than the human capacity to deal with it intelligently. So this scenario too, you know, technologically it's possible. Now you now have artificial intelligence and many digital learning systems that are amazing, simply. And the pandemic has also increased social acceptance for them. But we are not ready for that now. There's a great risk, you know, that we have, you know, students with amazing computers and poor skills, and that's the toxic combination. So I think, you know, I, I just wanted to show you this spectra of the second scenario. Not everything that is technological possible will make sense for young people. Now. Humans have always been a lot better to invent new tools than to use them wisely, and education, I think, is no exception to this. Now. Um, I also want to show you this chart. You know, one of the most interesting findings from PISA is this negative relationship between technology intensity and learning outcomes. Some people say, "Well, you know, technology allows you to learn, you know, in new ways and, and, and amazing kind of scenarios." Uh, but actually, the reality is that the more technology is deployed in classrooms, the worse students come out, and that's quite consistent across countries. It doesn't mean that technology is, you know, you know counterproductive to learning. But it means that often we use it in a way that makes learning more superficial, more kind of thin and more kind of uh, uh, consumeristic rather than uh, genuinely engaging and interactive. So that's some thoughts on the third, uh, uh, se second scenario. The third scenario is the one where schools become you know, more the center of society. The academic part is just one. Uh, but basically st uh, schools become a very important part of our communities that provide the glue that hold our societies together. And we can see some countries actually working towards that. Now, Estonia, Finland, Denmark, uh, lots of really interesting examples where schools are now, you know, uh, take a much broader mandate than just educating children. And then there's a the first fourth scenario, you know, maybe one day, you know, there will be no longer institutional learning. Now, basically, we will learn anywhere, anytime, anyhow. And that sort of, again, the world of work, the world of learning, great workplaces will be great places of learning, and so on. That's another scenario that, you know, is not impossible. It looks unlikely today, but it's not impossible. But again, if we wanted to make that happen, we will need to ask ourselves difficult questions. Now. In that world, you know, what is the balance between the teacher and the technology? No? You say, well, on the left side, yeah, we don't want teacher control everything. On the right side, well, probably we don't want that, you know, technology takes over completely. No? But then where do you want to draw the balance? You want to sort of uh, get, you know, that balance between the human and the technological side right. No? What is very clear is that learning has never been a transactional process. Learning is always a social, a relational process. Now, the role of teachers in the technology world will not become less important. It will become far more important. But how do you integrate those two worlds? I think, you know, on this, under this scenario, we need to think about those questions uh, much more seriously. You know? And we need to think about, you know, how do we actually sponsor innovation in this system? And you think about global education, venture capital is still very, very limited in the field of education. You compare that with health or so, it's tiny. They're not very, very good to mobilize resources for really, you know, out of the box thinking. 
And it's also interesting how this has evolved, you know. In 2014, it was mainly a story about the United States. Now, most of the education venture capital came from the United States. Now, it's mainly a story about China. Now, most of the venture capital comes again from one country. And other countries, you know, Europe, uh, where I live, is just this green, tidy bit at the top, you know, completely irrelevant in this picture. You know. That's, I think, something we have to think about. If, you know, we, we are looking towards a more kind of uh, dynamic, evolving education system, less institutional, we have to look at the needs where this is going to come from. You know. And of course, you know, these were just four scenarios. You can develop a hundred, a thousand of those scenarios, and it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we are open to alternative futures. You know. And let me think about, you know, the goals and functions of those futures, the organization and structures that can best support them, the kind of people that we need to sustain them, the governance, the geopolitics, and also, you know, what does it mean for public authorities? And what's the role of the public uh, sector in a system that is uh, undergoing different uh, evolutions? You know, that's really the important part for us to become more open. And then we find, you know, good balances between modernizing and disrupting education, between establishing new goals within our existing structures, you know, to reconcile, you know, global mindedness with locally rooted students and teachers, you know, to be more innovative in the system that is so, you know, such a conservative social enterprise. I said this at the beginning, to realize potential in the reality that is around us. Of course, you know, everybody would like to have a spaceship bringing you new teachers that do all those magic things. But no, the challenge is how do we advance our systems? How do we actually help the current teachers to grow into that new environment? And, you know, the pandemic has shown us actually teachers can actually manage a quite steep learning curve if the system enables and facilitates that. How do we integrate the virtual world and the face-to-face -face world? And how do we, you know, make sense out of education and learning in relative terms? Well, I look forward to our discussion on those kinds of challenges. Thank you very much.